Hey everyone, so we've already reviewed the Core i7-8700K and it's fast. In fact, for gaming, you might even describe it as stupidly fast, with only those running high-frequency displays likely to see its tremendous power really put to the test. And that kind of begs the question, do we actually need such a powerful, expensive chip? $350 isn't exactly peanuts, and Intel has two more Coffee Lake six-core chips it can offer at much lower prices. Lose hyper-threading and some clocks, and the i5-8600K is around $100 cheaper. Lose some more frequency, and you can have the i5-8400, yours for around $180, $190. And as you can see from the specs table here, that otherwise still fully enabled hexa-core processors with nine megabytes of cache, and of course the i5K chip will overclock. So that's the lie of the land with the Coffee Lake S line. More cores and more cache up against KB Lake really, and that's nice. The i5K is more expensive than its predecessor, but the $180-8400 puts the cat amongst the pigeons somewhat. The one issue we have right now being that it's a locked processor and you can only buy an overclock capable Z370 board to run it on. Overkill basically, but that's where things stand for now until the cheaper boards appear. Oh, and one more thing, Intel's base and boost clocks kind of seem to be, well, sort of meaningless these days. Case in point, the 8400 runs all cores at 3.8 gigahertz, changing the face of the spec comparison considerably, bearing in mind the $60 gap between that and the 8600K. Okay, so here's the system I'm using for testing. The ASUS board we used for the i7-8700K review is swapped out for a suitably mid-range Z370 alternative, the MSI Z370 Gaming Pro Carbon AC. I'm still using 3000 MHz Corsair Vengeance LPX, but for cooling duties I'm pairing the 8600K with my closed loop H110i GTX solution, once again from Corsair. But the i5-8400? Well, no cooler was supplied for the chip, so I dug out this Intel heatsink and fan. It's only a 65 watt processor, and once non-Z boards are out, chances are that it'll be something like this that you'll be using with it. And that's absolutely fine. Some basic benchmarks and video encoding tests first. No real surprises here. Single core performance in Cinebench for the i5s is faster than Ryzen, but multi-core isn't. The last gen KB Lake keeps up in single core performance, but gets wiped out completely on many thread tests as you would expect. In fact, Cinebench here suggests that even the lowly 8400 can keep pace with a 7700K at stock clocks, which is remarkable. Moving on to 4K video encoding with Handbrake. The 8400 beats the 7700K here, and while H.264 sees a pitched battle between the i5s and the 6-core Ryzen's, HEVC encoding sees Intel's better AVX performance pull ahead of both 1600 and 1600X. What about gaming then? So yeah, let's make no mistake about it. The GPU is your primary limiting factor for gaming frame rates, meaning that for the most part, your choice of CPU when gaming is all about overhead, future-proofing if you like, and we try to measure that level of overhead by running all games with an overclocked Titan X Pascal at 1080p resolution. The CPU runs the game logic, it prepares instructions for the GPU, and our aim is to make that the limiting factor in the system, and in the process it also highlights how fast a RAM may or may not improve CPU performance. Stock frequency tests first then, with the i7-7700K acting in its capacity as the last-gen Intel flagship. Far Cry Primal to begin with, a game that loves single-core frequency and memory bandwidth. There's not much in it, with all processors bar the 8400 essentially offering a very similar experience, so don't go into a Coffee Lake upgrade expecting a massive IPC boost, because it's not there, it's all in those extra cores. The 8400 lags as you would expect, it's just a little slower at the end of the day, but I've also limited it to 26, 66 megahertz memory. Now I could run the same 3000 megahertz frequency on this Z370 board, but I still think the 8400 is best suited to a less expensive board, and there, 26, 66 is going to be your limit. And yes, all my gaming tests are also carried out with the 8400 with a basic Intel cooler strapped on. 
the Ashes of the Singularity test is far more of a multi-threaded workout and kind of stands alone as the closest thing we have to a kind of synthetic bench for a game engine. The results offer up a revealing picture. The i5 8600K and 7700K occupy the centre ground here, while the 8400 brings up the rear, let down by its slower clocks and slightly more constrained memory bandwidth. Now for reference though, the 8400 is still 20% faster than the 7600K at stock clocks. Some excellent results here with The Witcher 3. I mean, this game absolutely loves Coffee Lake. There's no doubt whatsoever about the pecking order here. 8700K and 8600K lead the charge, leaving the 7700K and 8400 to battle it out for third place. In actual fact, there's no real winner there. Both deliver the exact same result across the run of play in this benchmark. Now, it's worth remembering that we're artificially pushing CPU performance to the forefront here, but even with our overclocked Titan X running at a stupidly low resolution for that particular GPU, there are times when all CPUs simply do a superb job. The Division, classic example here. Curiously, Coffee Lake in all three forms beats the 7700K, but not by anything worth commenting about, really. Similarly, Assassin's Creed Unity sees the four processors spread out just a touch, but really it's the same basic result at the end of the day in terms of the gameplay experience. My takeaway here really is that all four of these processors are phenomenally good. The 8700K obviously has the most overhead even at stock speeds, but all the scores here are excellent. As long as a cheaper board can run the 8400 at the same speed as the Z370, that's going to be hard to beat for the more value conscious gamer while the i5K chip should last for years once overclocking is factored in. So where do the new i5s leave Ryzen 5? Well, my 1600, 1600X review saw me give a thumbs up to AMD, albeit with concerns about future-proofing. I mean, Ryzen 7 isn't actually that much faster than Ryzen 5. Now, let me remind you of what tipped it for me. Performance in the most demanding, heavily threaded scenes. So here in AC Unity, in this super dense area in Notre Dame Square, the 7600K was fast, but Ryzen was faster. Then there was the infamous Crisis 3 CPU stress test, where Ryzen 5 rinsed the 7600K in heavy scenes. Its average frame rate kind of artificially boosted by being faster in simpler areas, not the more complex ones where Ryzen excelled. The rise of the Tomb Raider's CPU heavy geothermal valley, faster on Ryzen once more. The bottom line is that we are now in the many core era with almost every game supporting six cores at a minimum. And even with prodigious overclocking, the older quad i5 was starting to look a little bit outdated. Now Ryzen has six cores, 12 threads, so the question is whether the Coffee Lake i5's lack of hyper-threading is an issue. Well, one thing's for sure, single thread performance still remains Ryzen 5's Achilles heel. We've got the 1600X at 4 GHz here, effectively as fast as you can make Ryzen 5 go. And both Coffee Lake i5s are way ahead. So just like the 8700K, Intel's six core chip retains the strengths of Kaby Lake, and it doesn't have the weaknesses of the many core Skylake X offerings. The same can't be said for Ryzen. Games with heavily multi-threaded engines are a little bit more complex, so that Notre Dame scene in AC Unity, Coffee Lake is tons faster this time around, so the extra cores are helping to make up the difference. Though one thing I did notice is that the Ryzen 5 has better consistency, and you can see that here in this scene. That red line on the frame time graph is smooth, while the i5 equivalents are exhibiting jitter. It's in the region of four milliseconds, so not exactly a disaster for Intel, but curious nonetheless, because it's just not there on the AMD chip. So what happens when we rerun that Crisis 3 stress test that proved so disastrous for the KB Lake i5 last time around? Well, I've got both Ryzen 5 1600 stock and 1600X overclocked to four gigahertz here to show the spread for AMD along with the stock 8600K and 8400. Kicking off the bench, Intel takes the lead, and you'll note that any simpler scene with most of the background occluded sees that lead widen. I mean, Ryzen's looking pretty poor here by comparison, regardless of which measurements we use. However, it's scenes like this that I find interesting. Looking out over the jungle here, the extended draw distance means more objects being prepared by the CPU and sent out to be drawn by the graphics card. 
and suddenly the 8600K and 8400 are being crushed by both of our Ryzen test subjects. I find this fascinating actually because performance tends to get defined by average frame rates and so by extension we sort of think about in the moment performance between processors as relative and constant, a bit like this GPU bench. Whether it's AMD or Nvidia the same workloads tend to result in a series of parallel lines on our frame rate graphs. So let's say GTX 1080 Ti is 25% faster than Vega 64, just for example. We kind of expect it'll be 25% faster all of the time. But clearly that's not the case with CPUs. Ryzen 5's additional threads are making a difference here. Thing is, as fascinating as the example is, it's pretty much the only one that I can find. Now, I still love Ryzen 5, but other multi-threaded benchmarks just show Intel taking a lead sometimes a commanding one. I mean, the Witcher 3 engine is highly threaded, but the results here speak for themselves. Ryzen isn't slow by any stretch of the imagination, but when I buy a gaming CPU, I'm looking for overhead. I want my system to last for years, and it's pretty clear here that the i5 is offering more. And if that's not fast enough, there's an upgrade path to i7, which does have all of the strengths of the i5, plus the hyper-threading that Ryzen offers. So the best of both worlds, really. And yes, of course, the 8600K itself can be overclocked. The sample I received hits five gigahertz at 1.3 volts, and is actually a fair bit cooler than the 8700K I tested at the same frequency. Now, mileage will vary, of course, according to the silicon lottery, but let's see how Coffee Lake and KB Lake compare across i5 and i7 with both at the max frequencies I could extract from them. So if Ashes of the Singularity is like a synthetic bench built around a game engine, the results are intriguing. The 8700K at 5 gigahertz is about 22% faster than both the overclocked 8600K and the 7700K, which offer uncannily similar throughput. The 7600K at 4.8, yeah, it's just not at the races. This bench does demonstrate that even at 5 gigahertz, a game engine can utilize hyper-threading that sees an i7 significantly outperform an i5 clock for clock. It also reveals just how potent hyper-threading actually is. I mean, the 7700K is down two cores and 200 megahertz, but hyper-threading is keeping it in contention against the six core 8600K. Crisis 3, we saw the benefits of more threads with the Ryzen comparison, so what happens with overclocking? Yeah, this one is interesting. Those simpler scenes we discussed earlier where the i5 beat Ryzen, the current gen Coffee Lake and last gen i7 kind of hit their limits with the 7600K sort of doing its best to catch up. But in those heavier scenes where Ryzen excelled, well, the overclocked 8600K can push ahead of the last gen i7 by anything up to 12 frames per second in the thick of the action. But you know, we're looking at fewer cores here and a clock deficit, and once again, that old i7, it's still competitive. If you bought a KB Lake 7700K or even a Skylake 6700K, which is essentially the same thing, the bottom line is that you've still got a hugely capable processor on your hands. But you know, remember that we are doing our best to engineer CPU-bound scenarios. AC Unity demonstrates that the majority of titles offer very similar performance when paired with an overclocked i5, be it Kaby Lake or Coffee Lake. But yeah, it is possible to push the new i5 and i7s apart in performance terms, though the extent to which will vary considerably. And remember, our Witcher 3 stress test really loves the new architecture to the point where there's a clear gap between the new i5 K chip and the KB Lake i7, both pushed to the max. Do you want that overhead now or later though? That's the question. In the here and now, I can only think that users with 120, 144 hertz screens, the i7 is for them. As for the 8400, well, it's another awesome chip, clearly, but it's a value play and should be paired with a value board not a Z370 monster. Now, in theory, a Z board can get more performance from this chip if you use faster memory, even with a locked processor. However, tests we did proved somewhat inconclusive. The boost just isn't pronounced. The upcoming non-overclock orientated boards can still pair this chip with 2666 MHz DDR4, and that's a good pairing for the 8400. Just steer clear of 2133 MHz RAM. Okay, so next question, the great 2500K debate. Sandy Bridge debuted in 2011 and gamers loved it exactly because of the overhead it offered. 
fast out of the box, plenty fast enough for the games of the era actually, and with some awesome overclocking capabilities, this chip rightfully earned its legendary status. I've got an old video on the channel about how well it holds up today, and if you want to get more out of that old platform, I do recommend an upgrade to an i7-3770K with some 2400MHz DDR3. Trust me, your system will be revitalized. But if you want a new PC, well, check this out. My library data has the 2500K paired with the fastest memory it can, 2133MHz DDR3, and it's overclocked to 4.2GHz. Now, 4.6 is really the sweet spot, so that red line can push up just a little bit. However, 4.2 is just a touch faster than the 8600K's all-core turbo. So what do we see? Well, all of those architectural improvements and two extra cores can result in dramatically improved performance. The i5-8400 is about 50% faster here in the Ashes test, the 8600K extending the lead to 72%. Obviously, the 8600K's own overclock takes things to the next level, and it's almost twice as fast at that point. Far Cry Primal single core focus doesn't change the results that much though. The 8400 is 40% faster, a lead increasing to 51% with the stock 8600K. A quick look at the Witcher 3, the 8600K is getting on for twice as fast as a similarly clocked 2500K, and the yawning chasm in performance on the frame rate graph, not to mention frame time consistency, well, I think it speaks for itself. And as you might imagine, it's the same for Crisis 3. The gap only looks tighter here because we've had to squeeze the grid down a bit to contain all the data, as the bench varies in performance so dramatically. Okay then, so let's wrap this up. The i5 has always been a great gaming CPU. The legions of you out there still using a 2500K sort of proves it. And the i5 has always been the gamer's go-to chip for a new build aimed at 60fps gaming. The 8400 is a pretty awesome processor. It can probably match a last-gen locked i7, actually. But the K-chip is a bit faster owing to its higher stock clocks. But still, 90% of i7 gaming performance for $190, not bad. The 8600K offers better value compared to the i7. It overclocks like a demon, but even so, its lack of hyper-threading can be measured. And I think if I were a high-frequency gamer, I'd be paying the extra cash for the i7. It just keeps your lowest frame rates and highest frame times at bay better than an i5, which, once again, well, I still think it is the default choice for someone looking for a hugely capable system with a long shelf life. Okay, so that's your lot for now. Do like and subscribe to support our work, and follow us on Twitter. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.